talking about the endomembrane system, um, and I showed you the video about how the free versus bound ribosomes either produce proteins that get exported from the cell or remain in the cell. The things that transport them are vesicles. So, just a reminder, uh, this is our the cell. It has a cell membrane. What's that membrane made out of? Phospholipid. How many layers? Two. Good. And then we have in a eukaryote, we have the nucleus. What's the in the nucleus? DNA in the form of DNA plus proteins, which makes chromosomes. Right? And so that's how we package it. It's wound in there. What allows the nucleus to maintain its shape? Right, nuclear lamina. Good. Uh, and what allows things to go in and out of it? Well, how do things get in and out of the nucleus? Pores. That's good. That's exactly right. So the nucleus has how many membranes? One, two, and the other one is shared with the ER. Right. Good. So. The outer membrane of the nucleus is shared with the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. You guys know that there's two different kinds of ER. There's one that's rough. Why is it called rough? Ribosomes. And so what's the what's the function of the rough endoplasmic reticulum? Yeah, but what does this do? It synthesizes proteins. Good. So, and then we have the smooth ER, and what's its job? Right? So, side of calcium storage for muscle contraction, what else? Synthesizes lipids, breaks down toxins. Yeah, yeah. So, that's the slide, slide, of, slide of carbohydrate metabolism as well. So, those are the kind of things that you'll need know for the test, right? The kind of questions I'm asking you guys. So this is part of the endomembrane system because they share a membrane, but there's another part of this that doesn't actually share a membrane, but it it's shares membranes through vesicles. So that's called the Golgi or the Golgi apparatus. Um, and so the vesicles travel from here in through here, and as they go through the Golgi, what's the purpose of the Golgi? Right, so it, it modifies, right. So I think this is where we left off, right? We were talking about the Golgi. So the so the the Golgi has two functions. One is it modifies the protein. So the proteins, you know, they've gone through a lot, right? They've been synthesized as amino acids in primary structure, right? Then they fold into secondary structure. Remember what those are? Alpha helix, beta sheets, then tertiary structure three-dimensional structure, right? Sometimes they have a quaternary structure, but that's not the end of it. Now, sometimes they get modified. So, uh, in some cases, you would add a lipid to it, and then what does it become? It's the bad cholesterol. What's the name for that? Or the good cholesterol? No? LDL? What does that stand for? That's the bad cholesterol. It stands for low density. Anybody know? Lipoprotein. So what do you think that is? The name tells you it's a protein with a lipid on it. So how do you think that got modified? Where did you think it got modified? In the Golgi, yeah. And then uh, we have things that are called glycoproteins. 
What do you think those are? Proteins with sugars attached to them. So these modifications occur, they can occur in the ER, but generally they occur in the Golgi. The other function of the Golgi is not only modification, but to make sure things get shipped to the right place. So you wouldn't want an enzyme that breaks down DNA to end up getting shipped into the nucleus, would you? That would be bad. So the Golgi's job is to make sure everything gets packaged and sent to its correct destination. And the Golgi has sides, right? So the side that's closest to the ER, we call cis because that means same, right? And then the one across, trans. Any questions about that? All right. So, so that covers, well, that covers for the most part the endomembrane system. The, now we're going to talk about lysosomes. So we've already discussed lysosomes. You guys know what they are, right? And lysosomes have a low pH. They're the stomachs of the cell, so to speak. And they have destructive enzymes in them. Their job is to do hydrolysis reactions. Remember what hydrolysis does? What does it do? It adds water to do what? Breaks stuff apart, right? So it has nucleases, and we know that's an enzyme because it ends in ASE, right? You guys in the Tuesday lab did the enzymes too, so you know ASE is enzymes. So what do you think that breaks down? DNA and? What's it? RNA, right. So the nucleases break down DNA and RNA. And then there's proteases. What do you think that breaks down? Good. Proteins. And then there's carbohydrate aces. Carbohydrases. What do you think those break down? Sugars. And then there's lipases. What do you think those break down? Yeah, fats. So I, I like to think of this as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, okay? These are all very destructive enzymes that their sole purpose is to take polymers and chop them up into monomers. So what are the monomers of, of DNA and RNA? From chapter five, what are the parts that make DNA called? Nucleotides, good. What are the parts that make proteins? Amino acids, excellent. And carbohydrates, glucose is one, D different sugars, right? It varies. And then lipases, so we covered that in the chapter, right? Uh, three fatty acid tails, glycerol heads, sometimes two fatty acid tails in the case of phospholipids, or in some cases none because it's synthesized from cholesterol, like the steroid hormones. All right. So, uh, the sole job of this is to digest stuff, but it also has another function. Um, its function is to break down stuff that you produce, right? So let's say that you made an mRNA because you're cold, and that mRNA makes a protein that causes you to shiver. Do you want to shiver forever? No. Then you need to break down the protein that caused you to shiver and the mRNA that caused you to shiver. So how would you do that? How do you think you would do that? Put it in the lysosome, right? And then it gets chopped up in its parts and it gets recycled again. Right? It's like a, it's like the those letters that you have that you stick on your refrigerator, right? You can change them around and make different words. And it's the same thing that your body's doing. So it's recycling the amino acids to make something else. And it's recycling the RNA to make another RNA. Because it just it's the order of the letters that matter. That makes sense? All right. So here's another thing that the job of the lysosome is. So one thing that we haven't talked about is the cell cycle. And the cell cycle can be divided into four sections. So the purpose of the cell cycle is to make new cells. You guys are constantly making new cells. The cells that are in your skin, 
those are constantly being replaced. The cells that line your you know, digestive system, those are constantly being replaced. Your blood cells, your white blood cells, and so on and so forth. So the cell cycle is the process that the cells take in order to make two new cells. And the first part of that is called G1, which is also known as gap or growth. Because if you're going to double, if you're going to take one cell and make two cells out of it, what's the first thing you want to do? If I had a lump of clay and I chopped it in half and chopped the other parts in half and I kept chopping it in half, what eventually would happen to the clay? It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And we already talked about there's a lower limit of size for cells. So will that work? If you want them to be equal size, what do you have to do? You have to grow. You have to double in size. The cell literally has to double in size before it can even think about dividing into. Does that make sense? Because you don't want to keep shrinking. And then what's the next thing you think you have to do? So you need to copy your DNA, right? And that is in that what we call the S phase, which is synthesis. You guys don't worry about all this stuff, right? I'm not, this is not going to be in chapter 12 and 13, but I'm just giving you enough information so that you understand the function of the lysosome. So this is where the DNA gets copied. And so you guys know that you have how many chromosomes in every one of your cells? 46. Good. So when you come out of this, how many chromosomes do you have? No. If you double your DNA, how many are you going to have? I hope 92, because if you don't, there's a problem, right? I mean, having one extra chromosome causes Down syndrome, right? So what do you think would happen if you had 46 extra chromosomes? It's not survivable, right? No, there's no known human that could exist with more than one extra set, one, one extra chromosome. So once your DNA is copied, it's sort of committed. It can't go backwards and uncopy it. So there's a checkpoint that occurs here, which you guys are probably familiar with. So have you ever been out in the sun too long? What happens? Yeah, you get dehydrated. What else? You get a sunburn, right? So are you actually burned? So what's going on? What causes a sunburn? Any idea? Right, but that's not a burn. No. So, so what happens is, is that when you have DNA, so let's just say that your DNA has this sequence in it. So this, let's say this one's five to three. So the other one would be three to five, right? When you have these two letters next to each other, and if you guys remember from way back when, when you met, mess with the chemistry models, you probably don't remember, but the DNA lays, the bases lay flat like this, like rungs of a ladder. And, and so what happens is you, ultraviolet light causes those two T's next to each other to covalently bond to one another. So what do you think that does to the shape of the DNA? So the enzyme that copies DNA here, it doesn't fit right. So when it gets to that part, it slips or it puts in the wrong letters. And what does that cause? Mutations. And what do mutations lead to? cancer. So when you lay out the sun, you're causing mutations in your DNA at these what we call thymine dimers because they're two merus is part, so dimer means two parts. So thymine dimer ends up getting mutations. The longer you stay in the sun, the more mutations you get, right? So there's an enzyme here called P53 and its job is to check to make sure that 
you don't have too many mutations, right? So it's kind of like, you know, like a guard or whatever. So it says, let me check out, let me see how many mutations you have. Oh, no, you have too many. You need to go back and fix that before I let you go ahead. And it's not going to wait forever, right? It's going to give you a little while to try to repair that, to fix it. But if you can't fix it, it doesn't really have much of an option, does it? It can let you go through and make a new cell, but what happens to those cells that come from that? They're mutated too. Or what's the other option? Go kill yourself, right? You get in this line and commit suicide. That's the it. And so cellular suicide is called apoptosis. And so that's what, why you have a sunburn, right? Because the, the enzymes can't repair the damage, and so they tell the cells to kill themselves. It may feel like a burn, and it may blister, but the reason it is is because the cells are dying. And so your white blood cells have to go in there and clean up the mess of all these soldiers that are falling in the field. it right so if it's absorbing all the light it doesn't allow it to get to your DNA so the dark you are the more protected you are from ultraviolet light that makes sense and the lighter skin you are the more vulnerable your cells are to damage that's why humans develop pigments to begin with Protecting the DNA, it absorbs them, allows it to go through, like right, and it and that will destroy the DNA. So people with lighter skin get DNA damage faster than people with dark skin. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So now I talked about this in my other class, but one of the things that occurs in cancer is 99. Cancer cells, they don't have that. That enzyme's missing. What does that cause? There's no one to check you, right? So if your DNA's messed up, what's what does it do by default? It goes through the rest of the cell cycle and makes two new cells that carry on the mutations. Right? And so a lot of chemotherapies, uh, clinical trials now, are focused on trying to replace this missing enzyme so that it will allow the cells, the cancer cells, to kill themselves, basically, rather than to have to take chemotherapeutic drugs. Because those drugs kill all cells that are going through the cell cycle. So it doesn't kill just cancer cells, it kills skin cells, it kills blood cells, it kills cells that line your digestive system. In fact, people on chemotherapy equate eating food to eating ground glass because the, it, literally the inside of their digestive system is sunburned. It's the same feeling that you would feel. All right, so how does the cell kill itself? Right, so, so yeah, so it doesn't have, you know, any, it doesn't have any poisons or anything available to it. So what it does is that P53 sends a signal that causes the lysosome to open its contents, and then these guys get out, and what happens? Complete destruction. Everything gets torn apart from the outside of the cell. Everything, right? This is what the, all the cell is made out of. So there's nothing left. And then your white blood cells come in and clean up the mess. So, 
So if the DNA is too damaged, right, the cell kills itself. So it doesn't pass on that mutation. So the question is, how does the cell kill itself? And the answer is, it opens up the lysosome. So all of these nasty things that are contained in the lysosome are now free to destroy the DNA and to destroy the RNA and destroy the cell membrane. So without a membrane, you can't maintain homeostasis, right? Without DNA, you have no instruction set. So it basically rips apart the cell piece by piece. It's nasty, right? So that's what we're talking about. The lysosome's job is to complete the process of apoptosis. All right, so other organelles we're gonna talk about are mitochondria. Remember those guys? What's their job? So mitochondria, their job is to make ATP. So they do that by taking the food that you eat and the air that you breathe and doing a chemical reaction. Um, mitochondria, are unique. They're like the nucleus because they have two membranes. They have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. The inside of the mitochondria is called the matrix. And the reason they have two membranes is because they have to generate a charge across that membrane. They do it by moving electrons. And what do we call electrons that are moving? Electricity, that's right. So it's the same, the cells, this electricity causes little motors, and we'll talk more about this in chapter nine when we do respiration, but. The, remember the lab when you guys took ATP, you had ADP, which is the diphosphate version, and to make ATP, what did you do? Did you guys do this in the lab? You were supposed to. <laughs> so you have ADP, which is diphosphate. If you want to make triphosphate, what do you have to do? You got diphosphate. You have to add a phosphate, right? So we're not talking about just a P, we're talking about the phosphate functional group, which you guys did way back when in the chemistry lab. So this mo so how did you do that? How did you take ADP and add a phosphate to it? Right, but I mean, just physically, what'd you do? It's not a trick question. It together, right? So, literally, this this motor it opens, it takes the ADP and the phosphate, and it crushes like a like a like a trash compactor, pushes it together, and then releases it. So it takes ADP and phosphate and makes ATP. That's how it works, and it's all based on electricity. So. Anyway, it needs that charge across there to allow these motors to turn. If it only had one membrane, would that work? You couldn't build that charge, right? So you couldn't make ATP. Bacteria work the same way, except they don't have two membranes. They have, what's on the outside? They have a cell wall and a membrane, and they build charges across there. They have the same motors. They do the same thing. So scientists think that over time, a bacteria got inside another cell and then specialized into just being a mitochondria. So somehow it lost its cell wall and got a membrane and stuff like that. They think that because there's other signs like the ribosome. So the mitochondria have their own DNA. And because they have their own DNA, that means they have their own ribosomes. And the ribosomes look more like bacteria ribosomes than they do eukaryotic ribosomes. So that's some of the, you know, 
we don't know for sure, but that just kind of points to maybe that that happened. Um, so, you know, on a test, I might ask you, what's the function of the mitochondria? Makes ATP, right? How many membranes does the mitochondria have? What's the inner part of the mitochondria called? It's no, it's called the matrix, like the movie. And that's where the DNA is located, right? Does mitochondria have its own DNA? Yeah. In humans, the the sperm is actually pretty small compared to the egg. And in fact, the sperm doesn't have enough. It's almost only just DNA. Right, and some mode, some ATP to get it to move, but it doesn't contain any mitochondria. The mitochondria come from the egg, right? So when the sperm and the egg fuse, all remember all cells come from other cells. So that means that all mitochondria come from other mitochondria. So no matter if you're a male or female in here, where did you get your mitochondria from? Your mother. And so we call this maternally inherited. Um, right. So, I mean, that's pretty much it. I missed the first part of what you said. Matrix. Yes. That inside part of the mitochondria where is, the, is where the DNA is located. Yes. That's correct. And there's lots of these per cell, right? So what do you think, what kind of cell would have more mitochondria, skin cell or muscle cell? Why? more energy, right? So you have, so the number of mitochondria vary. There can be hundreds per cell, or just one. All right, any questions about the mitochondria? So the next one we're going to talk about are chloroplasts. Do you guys have chloroplasts? No. The only things that do, that are uh, autotrophs, remember that word from chapter one? What does that mean? means make their own food, right? So plants do this through photosynthesis. So these chloroplasts are the sites of photosynthesis. They're similar to mitochondria. They have two membranes. So they have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. The inside part of the chloroplast is called the stroma. But it's the equivalent to the matrix in the mitochondria, just a different name. And in there are these round discs called thylakoids. And those are stacked together on top of each other, and those stacks are called bronchi. So photosynthesis occurs in the membrane of the thylakoid. And these things build up charges too. Why do you think they build up charges across the membrane? I'll give you a hint. It's the same reason that the mitochondria did it. To generate electricity, to do what? Spin the motors to make ATP. Right? But they do it a little differently. They use uh, the molecule chlorophyll. And next week we'll do the plant photosynthesis lab and you guys will look at the chlorophyll that the text will extract from spinach. So the way that this works is, and again, we'll cover this in detail in chapter eight, but light strikes the chlorophyll, which is found in the thylakoids. And in the middle of that is a magnesium atom. What happens when we put energy on an atom? This is chapter two. So it, it jumps. Where does it jump to? Higher or lower? It goes away from the, the nucleus, right? And the more energy put on there, the further it jumps. And guess what we're doing now? Moving electrons are called electricity. Something grabs that Right? Enough energy is on it, and it starts the flow of electrons, which generates electricity. It's the same way that solar panels work, except plants have been doing this for thousands and million, you know, millions of years. Um, 
So that's how that works. Chloroplasts have their own DNA, so they also think these are ancient bacteria. Um, so what if I asked you guys on the test, where would you find DNA in a plant? The nucleus, the mitochondria, and the chloroplast, all three. That's exactly right. What about frogs? Nucleus and mitochondria. Excellent. All right, so any questions? That, we're done with the organelles. There's other ones like the peroxisome and stuff we haven't talked about, but I don't consider those important. No, I'm kidding. We just don't have enough time to cover all of them, so... At the pick and cheese. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the cytoskeleton. So remember, we're talking about a cell, and you have a membrane that's two phospholipids thick. So just to give you an idea of how thick that is, that is about the thickness. If you took a sheet of notebook paper and you sliced it long ways, about ten thousand times, that's how thick your cell membrane is. So if that's the only thing that was supporting it, what would happen whenever you left the room and you pushed on that door handle? <laughs> no. You'd turn into a puddle, wouldn't you? I'm talking about what? So if this is the only thing supporting your cells, right? Something at 10,000, one ten thousand the thickness of a sheet of notebook paper, you would, you couldn't do anything, right? You tripped and fell and you turn into a pile of goo. Does that make sense? So how do you prevent that? We know that doesn't happen. So think about the, how does the nucleus do it? How does the nucleus maintain its shape? The lamina, what's that made out of? It's made out of keratin. Right, which is a which is a cytoskeleton, right? So so the cell also has scaffolding inside it, just like the nucleus, to help maintain its shape and to give it strength. So all of these parts we're gonna talk about, their function is to help give rigidity to the cells. But they also have other functions that we're gonna talk about. So there's three different kinds, microtubules, intermediate filaments, and microfilaments. So we'll start with microfilaments. Microfilaments are made out of a protein. That protein's name is actin. Um, actin uh, looks like rods. So here's an image of actin right here. And so the rods are stacked on top of each other, sort of like this, I have my fingers. And whenever you want to contract your muscle, so let's say I want to pick up this, this marker, I have to contract my bicep. And so what's going on inside my muscle cells is there's a motor protein called myosin that pulls the actin fibers together. And that's a muscle contraction, right? And then when you want to put the pin down, you just go the other way, right? So those motor proteins literally walk. And that's how muscles work. So actin and myosin. So support, we talked about that. All of these are for support, muscle contraction, and also it's involved in localized contraction. So one of those things is during the cell cycle, we want to make two cells. How do we get those cells to split into two? Think about, think about our, our clay, right? So we're going to double the amount of clay. How do we get it to split in half if all we have is a thread? like dental floss. Just push it through. Yeah, so you wrap around it and pull. So that's what happens. Actin goes around the outside of the cell and those motor proteins keep walking it to make it smaller and smaller and smaller until it pinches in two. It's really simple. Um, you guys looked at the amoebas under the microscope. Hopefully you saw them. So they kind of ooze around. 
They do that by producing what we call a pseudopodia. You guys know what pseudo means? Fake. And what's a podiatrist study? So what does pseudopodia mean? Fake feet. That's exactly right. So the amoebas put out these fake appendages using actin, and they sort of pull themselves around. But they're not the only ones that do this. Your white blood cells do that too. They're hanging out inside your body, looking for bacteria and stuff to digest. So they just come and they go, come on bacteria, come to me. Give you a hug. And then they pull them in, right, with their pseudopodia. And then what happens to the bacteria? How? Yeah, you don't want to let it hang out inside your cell, you know, just doing what it wants. It's probably not, you know, friendly bacteria. So you want to get rid of it, and the easiest way to do that is shove in the lysosome, right? And the lysosome will rip it apart. So that's how that works. Any questions about that? All right, so the last one is cytoplasmic streaming. So you guys know that you have a heart, and that pumps your blood around, and that, you know, allows for gas exchange. But trees, they're completely heartless. So how do they move stuff around? We talked about one way. What did you say? No, that, that doesn't move stuff. That makes sugar. Okay, so what is that called? Cohesion. Cohesion, that's right. But there's another way they can do it too. So you ever like seen people at the gym take a rope, or maybe you've done it yourself and you lift it up and down and it makes a wave. So the actin can do that too. They can use the motor proteins to make it do that. And when it does that, it causes water to move around the cell. So I'll show you guys that. It's called cytoplasmic streaming and this is how it spreads nutrients around inside the cell and between cells as well. I'm surprised it's still on. But it you know usually goes off of like yeah. Special event. So these are chloroplasts and they are move around based on the, the actin molecules were causing this streaming effect. You see that? So that's cytoplasmic streaming. Any questions? Alright, All right, so just so you know, you know, I might ask you on the test, what's the cytoskeletal component that causes a B boid movement? Right, what are they made out of? Actin. What's the motor protein that allows them to move? No? It's right here. Myosin, good. Uh, you know, what other functions might it have? So those sort of questions. You guys need to know what it, what it is, and what it does, and what it's made out of. Get it? So the next one we're going to talk about is microtubules. Microtubules are made out of a different kind of protein. That protein is called tubulin. These are different. So, so actin is more like a rope or a thread. 
this is more like a hollow tube like you would see if you went to a bank you know where you like or like the pharmacy where you put the tube in there and it sucks the stuff over to the teller so uh, that's what microtubules look like they're much bigger so they move bigger things uh, they can move organelles the motor protein here is called dynein it's a different kind of protein remember things in the cell are specific to the specific shape they have so myosin has a specific shape that allows it to bind to actin dynein has a specific shape that allows it to bind to microtubules does that make sense and they can't you know, you couldn't use dynein to work with actin, and you couldn't use myosin to work with microtubules. And the way this works is really simple. So think about this. How do you guys walk? How are you going to walk out of this room? Legs? You're going to just walk without moving your legs? Can you do that? So then you have to change the shape of your legs to walk, right? Really? I want to see you walk out of here without changing the shape of your legs. That would be funny. Because you can't do it. So, on a molecular level, these motor proteins have legs too. They really look like legs. How do you get them to change the shape of their legs? So what happens when you add when you take one molecule and add it to another molecule? What does it do to that molecule? It changes its shape. What molecule do you think is going to get added to that? What's your gas? What's your energy? No. What's your what's your ATP? Right. So remember, ATP has energy in it, but you it becomes ADP when you use it. So what gets transferred? A phosphate. So you add a phosphate to the myosin, changes its shape. You want it to go back to the other shape. This is how you walk, right? Like this. <laughs> so you, you start with this shape, right? You want it to go back. What do you do? Take the phosphate off, right? So that's why ATP is used, and it's shown right here. That's why ATP is your energy, because it causes that to change its shape. And when you get it to change its shape, you can get it to do stuff. It's a transfer of a phosphate, and that's how, and that's, that's how, that's the reason you make ATP to transfer a phosphate. It can do amazing things. We're going to talk all about this whenever we get to chapter eight, and we get to the metabolism chapter, and you'll see that it not only can move your muscles, but it can generate energy. It can generate electricity. It can do all kinds of stuff. In fact, it does everything, doesn't it? Makes you think. Makes you your eyes work. All right. So, microtubules allow movement of organelles by adding and removing phosphates. It also it takes part in separating the chromosome. So, let's go back to the cell cycle got 92 chromosomes, right? How many chromosomes do you want in these cells to make them normal cells? So how do you do that? You're going to have to divide this into two. And so the chromosomes, let's, I'm just going to, I'm not going to draw 92 chromosomes, but I'll draw four. So let's say the red ones you got from your mom, the black ones you got from your dad. So microtubules they come out and they attach on opposite sides and they allow them to separate into different sides of the cell before it gets divided into two so that's another job is they're separating chromosomes in the cell cycle this occurs in mitosis This is called the M phase because that covers them both because they both start with M. All right, 
So the last thing is cilia and flagella. So earlier in chapter five, I showed you guys the picture of the cilia from the cells that line your small intestines, and they beat your food through. The, where else would you have cilia in your body? Right, so in your lungs and your trachea, its job is to get all the pollutants out of your lungs that you breathe in on purpose or on accident. Um, and then the way that cilia work is there's lot, there's usually lots of them. So on the picture I showed you that there's lots of those per cell. And the way that they work is they work the same way that you would row a boat. So how do you row a boat? Right, so you, you take the oars, right? You put them in the water and then you pull on them, right? That's a power stroke. That's a lot harder. And then when you're done, do you leave them in the water? No, you take them out. So there's a recovery stroke, right? It's a lot easier to go through air. Then you put it back in. It's a power stroke. So cilia work like that. They have a power stroke and then a relaxation stroke or return stroke. And then a power stroke and a relaxation stroke. They work just like an oar would. And that's how they beat stuff along. The food in your intestines, the pollution in your lungs, so on and so forth. The mucus that gets in there, all that stuff. In fact, um, I'm not sure if I, got, I talked to you guys about this, but uh, you guys know whooping cough, bordetella pertussis. So you can get that, right? And you can take antibiotics and it kills the bacteria, but you still have the cough. Like in China, they call it the 100 day cough. Why is that, do you think? It's kind of. So the, yeah, the bacteria kill the cilia in your lungs. So even though the bacteria are gone, the cilia don't function until they can get regenerated which takes a long time. And so you can't get the stuff out of your lungs the way you normally would, so you have to cough it out. The cilia can't beat it out. Does that make sense? So flagella are different. Usually there's one or two per cell. And humans, a good example of this would be sperm, right? And the way that it works is it works kind of like a boat propeller, so it, it, except Let's say that you instead of a metal propeller, you would have like a whip on it. So it just spins around and it flops around. And because it keeps going like that, it propels it in one direction forward. So it's not as graceful as silly. It's kind of just kind of, yeah, flopping around. Um, but that's how it works. So it's completely different. All right, any questions about microtubules? So the last one are the intermediate filaments. We talked about these already. The, they're the components that make up the nuclear lamina. Um, and they're important for uh, tension bearing for the cytoskeleton. Uh, they fix the organelle position like the nucleus, so they form the nuclear lamina. But they also help reinforce cell shape. So you guys may or may not know this, but there are nerve cells that can traverse the entire length of your body. So you could have a nerve cell that originates from, say, the, the base of your spine and go all the way down to your foot in a single cell. And the way it does that is it has uh, what we call an axon. So this is what it looks like. And so what happens if that gets severed? Let's pretend it's a spinal cord axon. It won't function anymore, right? So what do you think you'd want to do to protect yourself? Would you want to reinforce that? And so your cell does by using intermediate filaments to reinforce that. It's the same sort of components that are in your fingernails so they're not so susceptible to being torn apart because once they're cut, you can't fix that impossible to reverse it. It doesn't fix it, it helps protect it, right? Right. 
Yeah, so think about it as like a, let's say like a, the core deer vacuum cleaner. So if, you know, someone ran around with scissors and cut that, that's it, right? You, you, it, so if you didn't want them to do that, you could put something hard on the outside of it to prevent it. And that's what your soap is. But once it's cut, it can't repair that. It doesn't have any way to splice it together. Because it's one continuous cell, right? You've broken the membrane, essentially, so there's no longer homeostasis, so it will die. All right, so just to remind you, like, for the test and stuff, questions, I'm going to ask, I'll ask you stuff like, what are microtubules made out of? And I don't want to know all the specifics. I don't need to know that. I just need to know it's made out of tubulin, right? Because that's what I put on the slide. What are microfilaments made out of? Actin, right? What are intermediate filaments made out of? Keratin, right? I might ask you, what, which one of these cytoskeletal components does muscle contraction? Microfilaments. Which one forms the nuclear lamina? Intermediate filaments. Which one is involved in chromosome movement and cell division? All right. So you're going to have to just learn all of this stuff because that's the stuff that we talked about on the slides. All right. I don't care that you know the diameter or the specific structure of it, but you need to know the protein it's made out of and its main functions. Okay, so cell walls, you guys know that cell walls are the hard exterior parts of plants. What are they made out of? Cellulose. Good. And so cells have a need to communicate to one another to let them let each cell know what's going on. It's called feedback. And so if cell walls, you guys know that those are really thick and strong. If they were solid all the way across, then each cell would be isolated from its neighbors. And that's not acceptable because then you can't communicate. So what cells do with cell walls is they have little channels in between the cell walls called plasmo, plasmodesma. And you can see that right here. So that's how these cells communicate with each other. Animal cells are different. So if you look at cells under a microscope, you'll see that cells aren't literally touching each other. There's spaces in between those cells, and we call that the extracellular matrix. So some spaces are massive, like there's no cells exist at all. Like, for example, your cartilage. Where did that come from? The cartilage fairy gave it to you when you were growing up. Cells make that, right? They produce it and they put it on the outside. So that's part of the extracellular matrix. Collagen, stuff that people shoot in their face, right, to get rid of wrinkles. All that's made by the extracellular matrix. But more importantly, so it, it provides cushioning, right, and support and flexibility and elasticity and all that stuff. But more importantly, it allows communication between cells. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you go outside, you trip down the stairs, and you cut your leg open. So what happens besides bleeding and stuff and crying and junk like that? What's going on at a cellular level? Okay, so you the plate will give that we're just gonna give that as a given. The platelets seal it up so no junk gets in. And then what happens? Alright, well let's say it's already dead. You put some iodine on it. What happens with the cells? So the, so the cells have to fix that big hole you just put in your leg. Well, to them it's huge. To you it might just be a little tiny nick. So they have to start dividing to fill in that gap. So what tells them to start dividing? And then when they touch each other, 
they stop. What if they don't stop? What do we call that? No, if you keep, if it cells keep growing and growing and growing and growing, we call that a tumor, right? And that's the first start of cancer is tumor genesis. So it's really important that cells communicate with each other because if they lose communication, that leads to cancer. And this all comes from the extracellular matrix, right? So there are things in here that allow cells to communicate with each other. You know, and, and a lot of these molecules are similar to the stuff that you find in cartilage. So, you know, you've probably seen the commercials, you know, you have joint pain, what are you supposed to do? What, that's what you see on the commercial. That's why they make the commercial. That's for something else. It's for, I don't even know what it is for. I've seen that one though. That's for arthritis or something. But, okay, so let's say you have, you know, what I'm getting to yeah, is like chondroitin, right? Uh, or, you know, chondroitin sulfates or these other things, like glucosamine glycans that they sell you and these pills that are like joint relief or whatever. They're selling you stuff that makes up the components of the extracellular matrix. Those are called proteoglycans. And so basically what it's trying to do is replace what your cells aren't making anymore. Does that make sense? Nobody watches TV. Alright. So, that's the end of chapter 7. I mean 6. And the screens are still on. It's shocking. I probably just jinxed it tonight. This is chapter seven. So chapter seven, is, the name of it is membranes, the structure and the function. So you guys know a lot about membranes already. What are membranes made out of? Phospholipids, how many layers? Two, good. And so if we have a cell with a membrane that's made out of phospholipids, what's on the inside of the membrane? It's a bilayer. So what what goes to the inside? Hydrophobic. So the fatty acids go to the inside, right? And then the outside are the water, the hydrophilic heads. Um, and so that means that can water cross the membrane? Well, is that a problem? No. You don't need the water. That's pretty special. You don't need water anymore. If you go on Survivor, you have a distinct advantage. <laughs> yeah? How to get in there? Magic? Yeah, so... In, in fact, not many things can pass this membrane, right? So, because of, the, because of the way that it's set up, because of the hydrophobic and hydrophilic sections of it, Water can't get through without a channel. That channel is called an aqua porin. Aqua means water, porin means what's a pore? A hole. So that literally means water hole. And those channels are open all the time. And we talked about this when we talked about the osmosis lab. And Hopefully the other lab talked about this a little bit too. But um, the only thing that goes through that is water, right? Because it wouldn't have that name otherwise. It would be called the aqua glucose porn or whatever. What about if you want to get glucose in the cell? How do you do that? Can glucose go across the membrane? So it can't, right? You can just ask any diabetic. Without insulin, it won't make the channels to allow glucose to flow into the cell. 
So that's why you have that issue of buildup of glucose in your blood. Or sugars in your blood. So I think you guys get it. The cell can decide what it wants to bring in and what it doesn't. And it's based on the channels that it creates. So we call that selectively permeable. Some objects can cross, others can't. And the cell decides what can and what can't and when. Just like glucose. So, so it's selectively permeable. It's right, right here on the slide. And each one of these channels, so if this one brings in glucose, that's all that it's going to bring in. Because the channel has to be a certain shape that only allows that molecule in. Everybody get that? So, you know, you can bring in iron in one channel, glucose in another, uh, you know, water in another, sucrose in another, and so on and so forth. Right, so that's a different technique, and that's called endocytosis. Yeah, this is, this. we're talking about individual molecules. Endocytosis is just going and grabbing a bunch of junk and pulling it in. So that's not selective at all. Yeah, I just showed you guys that so you would get the concept of how membranes fuse together. So this term, ampopathic, have we used this before? You guys remember? So, what did I use the term to describe? Right? So, that's dual nature, opposing nature, like Two-Face and Batman, right? And then, the, another thing is that amino acids are also amphipathic because one side of them acts as a base and the other side acts as an acid. And things that go to the mitochondria, proteins, the R groups are charged positively on one side and negatively on the other. So that would be considered amphipathic as well. Okay. So that brings us to the question, which is, we've got all these channels in the membrane, right? And if, this is just a cross section, but if it was three dimensional, it would be a sphere, right? So you have all these channels all over the cell, and the question is, are they fixed in the position that they're in, or are they free to move about the cabin, so to speak? So how would you find, so what do you think? Can they move around, or are they anchored? How would you test that? What would that do? Okay. I don't, I'm not sure, but, but the way that they did it was they took a human cell and they labeled all the proteins, all the channels on the cell with a certain color dye. So I think the artist in the book labeled the human one purple. And then they took a mouse cell and they labeled all of those proteins in that cell pink. And then they fused them together to make a human mouse. No, I'm just kidding. To find out if the, member, the proteins were fixed or not. So if they were fixed, what would happen? They wouldn't mix together, right? They would stay in that position. But if they're not, if they're free to move around, then the proteins between the two different cells would mix together. So, I'm gonna skip freeze fracture this. So what happened? They mixed. So that means that you guys are right, that they're free to move around in that. And it's more like an ocean. So the phospholipids are like an ocean and these proteins that are channels and stuff, they just kind of float around. And that sets up a unique thing. That means that if if the membrane is gonna if things are gonna move around in the membrane, if they're gonna float in there, then it has to be it has to have some 
liquid consistency, right? Does everyone agree? Because if it was frozen, they wouldn't move anymore. And also, what happens when things get cold? It shrinks, right? So if you have a channel that has a specific shape that has to maintain that shape, and the cell membrane got colder, what would happen to that channel? It would change its shape, and then it might not allow water in anymore. Would that be a problem? And what if it got too hot? It would expand. In fact, it would get so liquidy that it would just kind of fall apart. So the membrane has to maintain a certain fluidity. So how would you do that? So think about it, right? What are the membranes made out of? Phospholipids, so that's a head, and how many tails? What are the tails made out of? Well, they're, remember they're made out of fatty acids? Are there, is there only one kind of fatty acid? What are the different kinds of fatty acids we learned? What's the difference between saturated and unsaturated? Okay, it doesn't have double bonds, that's right. But are they different in their consistency? So if you wanted to make your phospholipids more fluid, what kind of fatty acid tails would you use? More fluid would be unsaturated, right? Because it causes it to bend and makes it spread out. And if, and if it was, so if it's cold outside, you wouldn't want to make it more fluid, right? So you would want to add more unsaturated, right? If it's hot outside, you want to make it more solid. So what would you do? You would add saturated fatty acid tails. So that's what plants do because they really don't have the option to get in out of the cold, right? You know, trees don't go, oh, can I come in? That's cold out. <clears throat> Right. So plants, when they get ready for the winter, what do you think they do? So to get ready for the winter, what do you think they would do? Add more. You would want it to be more fluid because when it gets cold, it's going to get more solid, right? So to counteract that, you would want unsaturated. So, but we, what kind of what kind of fats are unsaturated fats? Where do they come from? Plants, right? So plants can do that, but we can't because what are our fats? We're animal fats. They're saturated, right? So that's an issue. We can't switch out the fatty acid tails because we don't have that option. Well, what can we do to make things more fluid? What are the what's the difference between the saturated and unsaturated fats? It's the bonds, but really, what is it? It's the double bonds, but really, what is it? It's the shape. It spreads it out, right? So in in animals, all you have to do is change the shape. And to do that, you just shove another molecule in there. Guess what molecule that is? Cholesterol. So this is what animals look like. Cholesterol goes in between the lipids, the phospholipids, and physically bends the tails. Here, they're bent Why? Well, if this was an animal, I mean a plant, why would those be bent? Because they're unsaturated, right? 
here they're bent because cholesterol is in there so without cholesterol you couldn't maintain your membrane fluidity that means you could never go outside you could never run around you could never increase your cholesterol is important right so I might ask you on the test how do animals maintain okay so let's say you were gonna go to you know uh, hike Mount Everest so you had to go and prepare for your trip so you went to base camp and you did a couple of short hikes everybody knows Everest is cold I assume uh, so what would you what would your body do to to get ready for that as far as the cell membrane is would it add more cholesterol or have less cholesterol so you want it to be more fluid right so you would need more cholesterol Right? And if your body, people say, oh, you're used to the heat, right? You live in Phoenix. Well, yeah, you are because your body is removing cholesterol out of your cell membrane. And it knows to do that. The longer you're here, then it gets, it, it's ready for that. Does that make sense? All right. So this is what we talked about. In order to stay... Uh, functioning it has to have a certain fluidity and that's around the consistency of vegetable really. maybe a little thicker than that um, and cells can alter their composition of their lipids so plants can do that right um, and then animals what do they do they add or remove cholesterol from the membrane and so this is an example winter wheat increases the percentage of unsaturated phospholipids right before winter makes sense right because you want it to be more fluid if it's going to get cold outside all right so uh, I'll just go over this slide and then we'll end this uh, shows you that the, the outside of the membrane is very different from the inside of the membrane right and you can see that there's certain proteins that go across the membrane and so we call those integral because they're integrated into the membrane. Usually when you see that, that's going to be a channel. But there's also proteins that are peripheral. Like, for example, this protein is bound to cytoskeleton, so that's its job is to help anchor the cell in place. And it doesn't go across the membrane, so would it be able to transport things? No. So there's a major difference between integral membrane proteins and peripheral membrane proteins. Integral transports usually things across the membrane, peripheral usually does not. Alright, and that's it. Done. So I'm going to ask you, you know, I'll give you scenarios like you know, if it's, if, if it's going to be cold outside. Would you increase or decrease the amount of cholesterol in your cells? Or I might go, if it's going to be hot outside, would you increase or decrease the amount of cholesterol in your cells? Make sense? All right. Have a good weekend. I'll see you guys on Tuesday.